Welcome everyone to Cochrane Canada Live. My name is Adrienne Stevens. I welcome you here to today's webinar about Prospero. Before we get started, I just want to thank the funders of the Canadian Cochrane uh, Network and Centre, those being the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, in particular the Knowledge Synthesis and Exchange Branch, and to seven of their research institutes. Thank you to CIHR for their support. I also wish to uh, acknowledge PAHO, that is the Pan American Health Organization, the Regional Office of the WHO for the Americas, to the Research Promotion and Development Division for providing Illuminate for us to conduct these webinars. And as you know, today's session is a joint webinar with a Knowledge Synthesis Canada. And today I have Sophia Sosaurus with us uh, from a Knowledge Synthesis Canada. Welcome, Sophia. And I will hand things over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, so we'll be brief here. We just want to welcome everyone. And um, as you can see on the screen, we have the home page of the KS Canada website. Uh, we invite everyone to uh, check out the website and join. Uh, the URL for the website is kscanada.ca. And just briefly, I'll talk about some of the goals and the purpose of this network. Um, as I've alluded to, it's, it is a national network bringing together uh, researchers, po researchers, policymakers, and essentially others interested in knowledge synthesis. Um, knowledge synthesis is being very broad, including systematic reviews, meta-analyses, um, all types of knowledge synthesis. And another goal that we have is to educate and train folks in um, different techniques and styles of knowledge synthesis. And one of the reasons we're involved today is because we um, are a partner in that helps uh, launch Prospero. And that's what we'll be talking to today. So um, moving forward, um, speaking of Prospero, here is the background for this website. Allison Booth, one of our speakers, will be speaking to this much more detail. We just wanted to show you how this sort of looks. And we'll be providing the URL for this website a little later on. Um, so oops. thank you. Our first speaker today is Dr. David Mower. Dr. David Moore has a PhD in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics and is a senior scientist with the OHRI, that's the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Um, he's also the principal, princi excuse me, principal investigator of the Canadian Knowledge Synthesis Network and the OHRI's Evidence of, Ta Evidence of TAP program. He's a co-convener of the Bias Methods Group of the Cochrane Collaboration. Finally, uh, Dr. Moore is known for his leadership in developing guidelines for reporting health research, including the internationally adopted consort guidance for randomized trials and the PRISMA statement for reporting systematic reviews. So um, with no further delay, we'll just have Dr. Moore speak. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Sophia. I uh, um, Firstly, wanting to um, acknowledge the leadership of uh, Leslie Stewart, the director of uh, the Center for Views and Dissemination at York University in the UK, for her um, leadership in making uh, Prospero uh, possible and make it happen. Um, so um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes um, about why uh, protocol registration in terms of uh, systematic reviews. And one of the reasons uh, to consider um, systematic review registration is excessive uh, duplication of effort. There are uh, several examples in the literature of um, perhaps uh, excessive um, <coughs> The duplication of effort. Uh, one example is, is here. Uh, what's sort of interesting about this particular example is that um, the first review was published in the um, Annals of Internal Medicine, and a week later, another review was published in, in the British Medical Journal. Uh, given the expense of the uh, journal landscape, this is probably something that the journals didn't want to do had they sort of known about it above and beyond and the excessive duplication. We know since the publication um, of these 10 reviews over this um, short time period, five more have been published. If you were to use the dollar figures um, 
for funding uh, systematic reviews in the context of CIHR, that would amount to um, one and a half million dollars. And if you were to use in the context of funding in the United States through the Evidence-Based Practice Center program, we're getting close to four million dollars. So it, it, it's a lot of money, and it, perhaps we don't need ten reviews on any single question. Uh, another example is um, some work being done um, for the Ministry of Health in Ontario. Uh, we know that there are a number of reviews um, sort of addressing essentially the same question. And again, if we were to use um, the Canadian dollars in terms of CHR funding, it, it, it's, it's a lot of money and perhaps we don't need to spend um, that amount of money doing that, uh, so many reviews and the sort of same question. Another reason to consider um, systematic review registration is that it complies with the PRISMA statement, which as Sophia mentioned is a reporting guidance for systematic reviews and meta-analysis that evaluate healthcare interventions. Uh, item 5 uh, of the PRISMA checklist asks authors to indicate if a review protocol exists if and where it can be accessed, and if available, to provide registration information, including a registration number. So there are probably differences uh, in thinking about registration of trials versus the reviews. Um, in trials, is probably an ethical imperative to register information. Um, the thought being that uh, registry, registration of a trial uh, might reduce uh, full study publication bias and it might also reduce selective reporting biases. Thinking about systematic reviews, there, there, there's m perhaps more of a moral imperative uh, to register a review. Uh, another reason, uh, as I've mentioned before, maybe excessive duplication. Um, it's probably important in terms of um, a practice guideline development where the systematic review is, is an important part of developing a practice guideline. There are probably uh, health policy implications. Um, it's possible that uh, systematic review registration will reduce systematic review publication bias. And it's possible that it might reduce uh, selective reporting biases as well. Um, I mentioned the uh, the publication bias because um, it's we, we know that publication bias occurs at the uh, you know in randomized trials and, and other primary research such as observational studies, and it's it's unlikely that actually it sort of stops at the primary study level. Some work by Andrea Trico. Uh, suggests that um, about 12% uh, in, in this case of uh, completed reviews went unpublished. And if you consider um, the latest estimate that 11 systematic reviews are published a day, that 12% if annualized is, is quite a large number. Um, some of the reasons um, for not publishing uh, systematic reviews it was a lack of time, which is similar to some of the reasons for not publishing um, randomized trials. Um, Chris Salagi uh, did a very interesting study looking at um, uh, protocols um, within Cochrane compared to completed Cochrane reviews and noticed that the vast majority of them contained uh, major changes between the protocol and, and the final review. And many of those changes were in, in the methods and selective outcomes of the review. So I think uh, that's perhaps yet another reason to consider registration of uh, reviews. Um, and I think probably the, the moral imperative would be to what's wrong with transparency? What's wrong with sort of telling people or letting people know um, what's, what's going on? Um, here is just a picture of um, um, Leslie and Anita Palapu, who's the editor in chief of Open Medicine, 
which I believe is the first journal to um, recommend and in, endorse uh, Prospero and requiring uh, authors to complete registration of their review. Um, and I'd lastly just want to share with you the URL for uh, Prospero. And um, Sophie had mentioned the, the website, uh, but here is the URL. And I'll just sort of sign off by, by thanking you for, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Moore. OK, so our next speaker is Dr. Jesse Berlin. Uh, Jesse has a doctorate in biostatistics from the Harvard School of Public Health. And he's currently vice, pre excuse me, vice president of epidemiology uh, in the Pharma Pharmaceutical Research and Development Division with Johnson & Johnson. He has authored over 230 publications in a wide variety of clinical and methodological areas, including papers on the study of meta-analytic methods as applied to both randomized trials and epidemiology. He currently serves on an institute medicine committee developing recommendations for the use of systematic reviews and clinical effectiveness research. Welcome, Jesse. OK. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, I guess it is. Uh, Let me get started with the obligatory disclaimer uh, that the message here is blame me, don't blame my employer. They can dress me up um, and they can let me out the door, but they don't know what I say once I'm out the door. So um, these are personal views, I think supported by company policy, um, but I can't say that. Um, so. This is just a reminder, uh, just an apology in advance in case anything that I'm about to say seems very obvious. Um, it's, some things become obvious when somebody points them out to you. Now, I, I'm going to be a little bit redundant with what David just said, um, just to re really reinforce some of the points. Um, the first is we're, we're all here, I think, because we believe that systematic reviews are, are well accepted as providing, um, in general, the best quality evidence to inform um, policy and clinical practice. Um, we know over time there's been a huge increase in the number of systematic reviews um, published every year. And importantly, there is currently no single place to identify systematic reviews. Um, before the results are, are out there for everybody to see. Uh, and as David mentioned, there's um, concern, legitimate concern about publication bias, um, selective outcome reporting, and um, in general the thinking is that registration should help us avoid these biases. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and then just in general, principles, uh, registering review protocols um, should facilitate good practice by adding a layer of transparency of the whole, the whole process and, and outcomes of how things are done. M moving beyond um, sort of those justifications, let's talk about advancing the field of systematic reviews. Um, again, David um, focused on this idea of avoiding unnecessary duplication, um, which would then free up resources for doing other research topics. Um, I'll, I'll just qualify this uh, or uh, emphasize the point of unnecessary duplication. I, I do want to make sure people understand that a certain amount of replication is probably helpful. Um, updating analyses is probably helpful. Um, so the, the, I just want to make sure we're emphasizing this word unnecessary duplication. Um, I, another potential advantage of registration is that we could increase the efficiency with which things get done, uh, and this is a quote from a paper that David co-authored, um, by bringing together research groups with common interests. And so if we can get around the, the kind of competitive view of, oh, I know we can do a better job on this meta-analysis systematic review than those guys did and begin to think about collaborating, 
uh, we might actually do some good by doing that. Um, importantly, I'll, I'll come back to this point um, in a minute. A registry could really facilitate, create the opportunity for methodological research. Um, and this is a point that was raised in an earlier paper. Um, I'm, I'm going to make some specific suggestions in a minute. And the other point I'll just make from, from the US perspective is that there is now this patient-centered outcomes research institute um, known to its friends as PCORI, uh, which uh, will be encouraged, I, I think, and this is really just my view, I think will be encouraged to collaborate internationally, um, for example, in, in conducting research on systematic reviews. I, I don't know where they're going to end up for sure, um, but this is certainly a direction in which I would push if I had anything to say about it. Let me just make a, a little bit more specific proposal, and it's not real specific, um, but just to toss an idea out. Um, would it be feasible, would it be reasonable to perform randomized trials of methods of conducting systematic reviews? So now that we have a registry, uh, we have kind of a sampling frame in which potentially to conduct um, observational research, could we turn that into something proactive and prospective? So coordinating across multiple groups who do many systematic reviews, um, could we do something like, just as an example, um, randomly assigning systematic reviews to, um, a, a, let's say, include a consumer or not, or to perform uh, data extraction and duplicate or not? Uh, so really the point is to move from uh, what has been done in the past, which is largely observational, um, kind of the, the cohort of systematic reviews uh, derived from an arbitrarily chosen set of journals. Um, could we move into something that's now much more systematic because we have a sampling frame uh, of all protocols um, and could even become more of an experimental approach rather than strictly observational. And, and there are details to be worked out. Um, you know, ideally, in some sense, you might want to have a, a paired kind of design. You know, randomly assign one group to do the same meta-analysis one way and the same meta-analysis a different way. I think in the current climate of constrained resources, um, doing things in duplicate like that might be a challenge. Um, but I think we can work that out. So just in conclusion, um, systematic review registration, um, transparent, reporting, transparent reporting more broadly, I think will help the credibility of the research process in general. Um, and as we've both now said uh, numerous times, registration could help avoid unintentional and unnecessary duplication of effort. Um, if we can encourage collaboration with multiple groups uh, working on the same project, um, and we can avoid the competitive attitude um, that might lead to better products and more rapid production of systematic reviews. Um, registration, I think, could facilitate methodologic research. And I'll just uh, argue that, that what we're talking about here is really in everybody's best interests. So speaking as somebody who is employed in the industry, um, I, I don't see any threat to, to industry's interest here. I think in general, we're talking about improving outcomes for patients, uh, ultimately, which is a good thing. And in the end, um, it does come down to trust. Uh, I'm not sure who the dogs are and who the cat is. Um, but I think this is really what we're talking about here. And I guess Tammy is up next. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Berlin. Um, yes, our next speaker is Dr. Tammy Clifford. Uh, Dr. Clifford has a PhD in epidemiology and biostatistics from the University of Western Ontario. And she is the chief scientist at the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. Um, she joined CADIS in 2005 and has been there, uh, is, is there currently. And she also holds faculty appointments in pediatrics 
and an epidemiology and community medicine at the University of Ottawa, where she teaches in the problem-based learning modules for the undergraduate med medical education curriculum. She also th serves as a thesis examiner for the Master's in Epi program at U of O. Welcome, Dr. Clifford. Great, thanks very much and good afternoon. Uh, today I will be talking to you about CADIS' uh, perspective on the importance of a systematic review protocol registration. And uh, I will be using a few acronyms as I go through today's session, so I'll spell out the first one for you right now. And the first one would be CADIS, so the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. Uh, a little bit of background about us for those of you who might not be familiar with us. Uh, we are a not-for-profit agency that is based in Ottawa. We are at arm's length from government and provide advice, guidance, and recommendations to various decision makers in the Canadian healthcare system regarding the, the whole gamut of health interventions, so drugs, devices, procedures, uh, systems, and the like. Our advice, guidance, and recommendations are based on health technology assessments, or HTAs, and which, as you'll soon hear, are rooted in systematic reviews of clinical evidence. And that is uh, why I'm speaking to you today, because pretty much everything we do here does find its basis in a systematic review. And I'll be giving you my perspectives, um, or CADIS perspectives, as both a producer and a commissioner of, of dozens of HTAs, and thus dozens of systematic reviews, on an annual basis. Just very quickly, I'll go over the, the five W's of health technology assessment and then give you a, an insider's view of what, what goes on uh, when you're trying to support informed decisions within the Canadian healthcare system and then reflect on uh, the promise of Prospero. So what is HTA? Well, I'm, I'm not going to go into that definition because you can read it yourself. I've pulled this one from ENATA, the International Network of Agencies for HTA, and I know that they too are a supporter of Prospero. What I want to emphasize in this particular slide is that HTA studies, among other things, the medical or clinical implications of a particular health technology. Determining if a health technology actually works is the first step in our process. And how do we do this? Well, it's, it is, of course, via a systematic review of the literature. These next two slides, this first one of Canada and the next one of uh, a more international landscape, are not meant to provide an exhaustive list of who does HTA. Uh, anytime you try to create an exhaustive list, you're bound to offend somebody for forgetting uh, to name a particular organization. So instead, the intent of this slide and the next one is just to highlight the fact that HTAs, and thus the systematic reviews that form the basis of our HTAs, are done by many groups within government, outside government, in academia, in regional health authorities, and in hospitals. And this is the case in Canada and as well internationally. And this particular slide does come from the ANATA website giving you a flavor for just how global uh, the, the HTA enterprise is. Please keep this in mind as I go through this presentation and speak about the difficulties inherent in the old way, let's say the pre-Prospero way, of determining if we really needed to do a new HTA on a particular topic. I've already noted for whom HTAs are prepared, and it's pretty much for anybody who's involved in decision making within our healthcare system. And HTAs are carried out to provide a basis for informed decisions about the purchase and appropriate use of those technologies by doing a variety of things, but most importantly, by synthesizing the relevant literature, again, through systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So CADIS, in its position uh, within the Canadian system, is, has been created to support those informed decisions. But what we are faced with are a lot of challenges or issues. And these, these are not necessarily unique to us, and, and I'm not putting these forward to, to complain in any way, but just to make everybody recognize the multitude of perspectives that are being taken into account when we choose to do a particular 
health technology assessment on a specific health intervention. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these issues, but I will draw your attention to the very last bullet point. In, in effect, this, this is the crux of the issue for us. Which technologies do we choose to subject to a health technology assessment? Why is this an issue? Well, I've given you a few bullet points here. Um, in effect, right now in Canada, we have around 90,000 health technologies on our market that are contenders for an evidence synthesis or a health technology assessment. So faced with that sheer number of possibilities and knowing that there is just no way that uh, we, even if we harnessed all the capacity uh, in the country to do this, there's no way we could tackle all the technologies. So how do we as an agency determine which ones that we actually study going forward? Well, there are a variety of uh, criteria that are used, and a lot of prioritization schemes do exist out there. Uh, the commonalities uh, between them are noted here. And again, I'll draw your attention to the very last bullet point. So before we decide to push the go button and embark on a health technology assessment, we need to be pretty darn sure that there is not already an existing high quality current evidence synthesis that answers the relevant questions for Canadians. And so historically, how did we do that? Well, I've chosen to take a quote here from a, a very smart philosopher that the absence of evidence is not to be assumed to be evidence of absence. Historically, we would take a look at the CRD's HTA database. Uh, that was populated by INATA members. So again, HTA agencies who are members of an international network. We also used informal networks, such as the INATA Listserv, a Canadian uh, network of HTA producers, and then just connections. But if I may say, it was very difficult for us to determine with a great deal of certainty that no one else had done work on a particular topic or that no one else was starting or even considering to do work on a particular topic. And why was that? Well, not everybody was captured by those existing entities. And even amongst those of us who were part of that network, not everybody would share or not everybody would uh, share in a timely manner. And I think Jesse alluded to some of these uh, reasons for not sharing in his presentation. From our perspective, because we do rapid reviews, we were also uncertain as to what, uh, what reviews should be captured in the databases. And because of where um, we sit, uh, we are at arm's length from government, so we are allowed to put everything that we're studying into uh, the public domain. However, some HTA producers who are within government may in fact have a reluctance to acknowledge that a particular health technology is being studied until a time, uh, a time comes at which uh, the appropriate response would be ready. And of course, there's good old academic competition and protectionism. I should also note that there could have, uh, historically, there was a lag time in the provision of updates from what an HTA agency was tackling and when it got uploaded to the central database. And so you can imagine uh, the difficulties we had in determining whether or not someone else had already done work on the topic. Uh, I believe in, in David's opening slides, he did allude to just the, the sheer cost the monetary costs of duplication. And again, I, I'm a firm believer in the scientific method and, and the replication of findings is sometimes appropriate, but it's unnecessary duplication that can be costly. And it's not just the dollars and cents, but it's the opportunity cost. Because each time we tackle a particular health technology, it means that we're not able to study another one, given the finite resources that we have within our agency. To wrap up with just a couple of examples here, and uh, just to give you an idea of how big this problem might be, uh, the topic being surgical robotics for radical prostatectomy. If you look at what's been worked on by HTA agencies, six of them that I know of working on this topic, a Cochrane review, and at least four peer-reviewed publications. So I count that as being at least 11 separate efforts to synthesize presumably the same body of evidence albeit at different points in time. 
Second example on H-spot for diabetic foot ulcer. Again, if you add this up, it's 11 separate initiatives to synthesize what could be viewed as the same body of evidence. So for us here at CADIS, we see the promise in PROSPERO, uh, it being a win-win for all of us. Of course, better systematic reviews, but from our perspective here, it is that reduced uh, reduction in unnecessary duplication, which will then free up our capacity to undertake other work, whether that be on technologies not yet studied, whether it be on updating existing work, the knowledge exchange efforts to actually get evidence into practice, and all the associated education and support. As mentioned by Jesse, I do see the opportunity for this to, to promote collaboration and partnerships. And uh, in the end, it's all about globalizing the evidence, but localizing the decision. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Clifford, for that very interesting discussion. So up next is uh, Ms. Alison Booth. Allison is a research fellow with the Center for Reviews and Dissemination and is jointly responsible for the dis dissemination of CRD databases, research outputs, and services. She has extensive experience translating and presenting the findings of systematic reviews in a number of formats for a wide range of professional research and lay audiences. Her current activities include managing the development of the CRD International Perspective Register of Systematic Reviews, aka PROSPERA, which she'll be alluding to further, and the redevelopment of CRD's HTA database. Her research interests include biases in systematic reviews, the ways in which research influences policy and practice, and how research is portrayed in the media. Alison will be joining us from the UK. Welcome. Hello, and thank you very much. And on behalf of uh, Leslie and myself, I'd like to thank everybody for their enthusiastic support of Prospero. Um, Hi, Alison. Sorry to interrupt. Um, your um, speaker doesn't seem to be on, so I just uh, just remind you just to press the audio button, and then we should be able to hear you. Thanks. Hello. Um, um, right. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> smiley face. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for your uh, support for uh, for Prospero uh, on behalf of Leslie and myself, and um, welcome to the Prospero website. Um, the um, the site's been designed to be easily accessible and searchable to all. It's free to register and free to search, and we accept uh, registrations from anyone uh, as long as they're not uh, duplicates of the same systematic review uh, and that they're eligible and complete. Um, you can search uh, Prospero. Uh, is this the, uh, you can search Prospero here um, without joining, uh, and you can read all about uh, the, the um, uh, registry here. Uh, but if you sign in and or join, uh, you get access to uh, registering a review. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, Eligibility for inclusion in Prospero, um, initially registrations are being limited to reviews of effects of interventions and strategies to prevent, uh, diagnose, treat and monitor health conditions for which there is a health related outcome. But the long term intention is to expand the scope to include all systematic reviews with a health related outcome in the broadest sense. Um, registration uh, should take place uh, once the systematic review protocol is finalized, but ideally before screening studies for inclusion begins. Uh, completed reviews are not going to be accepted for registration, and Cochrane reviews uh, don't need to be added as we're developing a system for automatically uploading them uh, from the Cochrane library. Uh, if you... Um, uh, join and log in. Uh, this gives you access to my records. So um, this is uh, this is a uh, an example that I set up. And uh, if you then if you uh, select register a review or uh, click on your existing draft records um, or um, or uh, published records, uh, you'll get the template. 
I'm sorry this isn't uh, terribly clear on the screen, but the registration page has been divided into uh, four different sections, and each section contains um, some required fields, and these are um, uh, annotated by a red asterisk. When all the required fields within a section have been completed, this yellow uh, triangle becomes a green circle with a tick in it. And um, until all the sections are completed, all the um, required uh, fields are completed, uh, it's not possible to actually submit um, the, um, uh, the form. There are 22 required fields and uh, an additional 18 optional fields uh, in the form. Uh, the minimum data set was arrived at through an international consultation, um, which also informed a number of other aspects uh, of the uh, way the register has been set up. And I'd like to, again, thank everybody who participated. And um, papers detailing the consultation process and the outcomes are in preparation, and we hope to submit those for publication shortly. Uh, the form itself includes a mixture of free text and pick lists um, with the aim of keeping the completion as straightforward as possible while collecting the appropriate information in a searchable format. Uh, you can copy and paste from existing document and complete the form on repeat visits. All the changes are saved automatically or you have the option of saving uh, it yourself uh, on each section. You can validate uh, the page which uh, means if you press this, uh, uh, a big red box comes up to show you the um, required fields that haven't been completed. And you can also print uh, out each section. So when you've got uh, four green ticks, then the submit uh, button becomes live or active. When you submit a registration, um, you receive an automated email reply confirming that we've received your submission and it tells you um, when the response is uh, likely to be sent. Uh, at the moment I believe this is about five days. Uh, submissions are checked against um, the scope um, for um, completeness and for sense and uh, if accepted, uh, registration number is issued and they're published on Prospero. Um, sometimes they're returned to applicant for clarification, uh, but always an email is sent to say whether um, they've been accepted or the reason why uh, they've been declined. Once published on um, Prospero, they can be found in the search section. At the moment, there are just uh, a few records, so the simplest thing to do is to go to display all published records, and you'll get a list like this. Uh, the uh, search uh, functions, are uh, some of them are still in uh, the development phase, uh, but we'll have those up and running uh, as soon as we have more um, um, records to search. So if you click on... Um, uh, a record. Uh, this is the uh, the layout, and um, uh, the name contact is responsible for adding any protocol amendments to the record. Uh, these are then uh, displayed. The, the most recent is displayed in the body, and uh, the version history is available here. So all previous versions are uh, will be listed on the right hand side here. Uh, you can also uh, print out. Um, uh, uh, records, you can uh, save them as PDFs, and all the Web2 facilities are, are also available. Um, automatic emails are sent on due dates, um, such as completion and um, when uh, publication is anticipated. At the moment, Prospero is open. For, uh, well, was open for registration in February, and uh, we are currently seeking uh, early feedback from authors. Uh, we're planning a detailed evaluation after the first year of operation. At the moment, we're establishing mechanisms with commissioning and funding organisations to facilitate grant holder uptake and compliance. 
uh, we're agreeing registration processes with major producers of reviews um, and that will include uh, electronic uploading mechanisms for uh, new and updated Cochrane protocols. Um, we're currently promoting the registration phase of development of Prospero and we'll, we'll be um, promoting the uh, full site with search facility once the number of records has, has built up. So once again, this is Prospero, uh, this is the uh, URL and um, we're always welcome um, uh, feedback and you can uh, submit it either to the email address uh, there or via the contact information on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Okay, our last speaker is Dr. Jeremy Grimshaw. He is a senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and a full professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. His research focuses on the evaluation of interventions to disseminate and implement evidence-based practice. Among his many leadership roles, Dr. Grimshaw is the co-chair of the Cochrane Collaborations Steering Group, the, the director of the Canadian Cochrane Centre, the coordinating editor of the Cochrane Epoch Review, Review Group, and principal investigator of Knowledge Translation Canada. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Grimshaw. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like previous speakers, I'd like to really recognize the leadership of uh, Leslie Stewart and colleagues in CRD uh, in terms of moving this forward and um, just to welcome this as a, as a major sort of uh, um, uh, way of improving transparency and systematic use for the world. Uh, what I want to focus on today is thinking about uh, um, how we might uh, in ensure that people actually use uh, um, Prospero. The establishment of Prospero by itself is unlikely to necessarily need, lead to full compliance uh, unless we start to think about additional activities we might want to be involved with. Um, so the key question for us today is whether we can develop knowledge translation strategies which will promote greater use of Prospero by a broad range of stakeholders. Um, when I was planning this, one of the things uh, that I started to think about is, well, who are we trying to influence and what do we want them to, to do as a result of uh, a knowledge translation strategy? So I think we're trying to influence review authors, make them aware of Prospero, persuade them about the rationale for Prospero, uh, get them to intend to register uh, um, and reviews and know how to use Prospero uh, uh, um, to register their protocol. Uh, I think we also want to influence international synthesis collaborations like the Cochrane Collaboration, the Campbell Collaboration, uh, um, Evidence Based Practice Centres, uh, to, um, as a minimum, ask them to promote Prospero for their members, or preferably to recommend or require Prospero uh, or registration as part of their standing operating procedures. Uh, to use Prospero to try and look, uh, check to see whether reviews have been uh, uh, done uh, um, for their prioritisation process. Um, in terms of use of census, um, we might think about commissioning and funding organizations. And so uh, one might hope that they would use Prospero to help set priorities for both secondary and primary research, but also that they would require, as a, as a condition of funding, registration for funding systematic reviews. And finally, as, as Tammy has uh, um, alluded to, uh, huge benefits for guideline developers and HGA agencies who could use Prospero as an intelligence for planning reviews to support guidelines or HGAs and also uh, reduce inappropriate um, uh, 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 duplication of efforts. Uh, the final um, group might be journal editors, that, uh, and they may want to promote Prospero as an initiative to improve the transparency and rigor of high quality research. I uh, use Prospero during the peer review process to look to see whether uh, the review as presented uh, um, appears to reflect the methods uh, um, identified in the, in, the, in, the, in the Prospero database and to finally publish the Prospero ID numbers. And again, as David said, Open Medicine has taken some leadership in this and hopefully other journals will follow. So we can start to recognize that um, actually if Prospero is going to be a success, there are a wide range of, of different stakeholder groups that we need to try and influence. Uh, so how can we do that? Well, that's the uh, $64 million question. Uh, and we need to recognize up front that we'll likely need multiple channels by a coalition of willing supporters using a variety of approaches uh, to different stakeholder groups. Here are some of the uh, initial ideas that I had. And uh, actually, when we, we um, um, presented this at the launch of Prospero, it was clear that Leslie and Allison and other colleagues in York were already uh, doing some of these things or planning the other things. 
So I think during the initial launch period, we need to have a uh, basically a, 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 a create a lot of noise so people are aware of and exposed to the idea of Prospero. So we probably want to think about multiple commentaries across diverse journal groups, especially some major journals. And uh, Alison uh, and colleagues published an initial paper in the Lancet, which is helpful. We might want to think about information packages for key target audiences, so synthesis organizations, um, uh, Guideline International Network, uh, in our for now HCAI or funders. Uh, really to try and promote uh, the idea of Prospero and why we're doing it. And we may well want to go and, uh, and talk at different sort of um, um, conferences where uh, some of those key target audiences collect. Uh, from an ongoing perspective, um, we also need to basically think about maintenance of the website, have an opportunity, uh, use opportunistic promotion of Prospero. So as Jesse mentioned, Prospero might um, um, uh, uh, provide new opportunities to research uh, on the methods of systematic reviews. Um, but it would be really great that as we publish uh, methodological research that um, this is tagged back to Prospero and again uh, communicates the idea of um, Prospero as a, a vehicle for, uh, uh, for this type of work. We may want to provide slide depths for systematic review courses. Um, and we may want to develop community of users on web uh, in the Web 2.0 world. Um, we probably need to sort of look quite carefully about how to register systematic views in, in Prospero. So really uh, make sure that Prospero uh, is, is easy to use. There are lots of instructions and support for potential review authors as they try and register that. And again, it sounds like Alison and colleagues at York are really already sort of thinking ahead about this and, uh, and already are planning user testing and feedback over a 12 month period. But if, uh, and Prospero is actually remarkably easy to use, but um, I'm sure many people on the, uh, uh, the webinar are used to going to, to websites that aren't user friendly and we, we, we leave them very quickly. So it's really important that Prospero seems seamless, easy to use, uh, so the researcher uh, or the review author uh, um, and feels very comfortable about uh, using this. Um, I think if we're thinking about um, 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 other stakeholders, we might want to think about who do we want to request and to support and promote our Prospero. So there are major funders of, uh, of systematic reviews and syntheses. Uh, the National Institute for Health Research in the UK, Canadian Institute for Health Research in, in Canada, Agents for Healthcare Research and Quality in the US, and the National um, Health and Medical Research Council in Australia, to name just a few. But maybe one of the things that uh, uh, Leslie and people want to do is, is go out and try and uh, engage with these groups. So as part of their uh, conditions for granting, they say that uh, any systematic reviews need to be registered. There are an increasing number of national and global funded forums. So in Canada, for example, all the provincial funding agencies get together on a quarterly basis. And again, maybe we need to uh, target those meetings and go and talk to people uh, so they get a sense of, 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 of what this might entail. I think also we need to start gather, uh, uh, to, to, to think about gathering compelling stories. And I think Tammy and David both gave us examples of where the lack of Prospero um, uh, uh, meant it's very hard for um, uh, review authors to know about existing efforts and probably led to a, a significant deep case of effort. So if we could gather stories from um, uh, groups like CADF or guideline developers about how Prospero really helped them reduce the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, deep case of effort, um, that I think would be a huge benefit. So in summary, Prospero is a major international initiative to improve transparency and rigor reviews and reduce inappropriate duplication of effort. And the, uh, the, the leaders of this really have to be applauded. Uh, but Prospero is unlikely to be self-implementing. Uh, and I think there are opportunities to develop a comprehensive and ongoing knowledge translation plan that would recognize the need of different target audiences. But I think that to actually achieve that is going to require ongoing commitment and resources to achieve this not only from CRD and others, but anybody else who's interested in the uh, transparency of systematic review should become an ambassador um, for initiatives like Prospero. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers. So now we are ready for questions. If you have a question you'd like to ask one of the speakers on the panel, simply uh, just insert it in the chat room and then uh, we can direct it to the speaker. Uh, if you wish to use your microphone, again, just click on the button at the bottom left-hand portion of your participant window, and uh, that'll form a queue, and then we can instruct you. So we'll just give you a moment if you wish to uh, ask any questions. Oh, 
Okay, well, I just want to thank uh, the speakers once again for contributing and talking about uh, Prospero and the importance of registering systematic reviews. Thank you to all of you for joining today's session. Uh, and it looks as though we may have one question come through, so I'll just, uh, I'll just allow a moment for that to come through. What I will do in a moment is uh, send you an evaluation form so you could take the time to give us feedback uh, on Illuminate, uh, give us ideas for future sessions. I would be grateful. So I'll just allow another moment for that question to come through. And just to remind you that our next series uh, within Cochrane Canada Live uh, is a series in June about uh, the co who is the Cochrane Collaboration, learning to search the Cochrane Library, and then an overview of the steps of conducting a systematic review. So Maria, uh, you'd like to ask a question. So I will release my audio, and I will ask you to uh, just click on your audio button and ask your question. Thank you. Okay, Maria, it seems as though your audio feed isn't coming through. So what I'll ask you to do is uh, just uh, add your question into the chat room. And we've had one come through. Uh, and I'll just uh, cue this up. Uh, and the question is, in order to populate the Prospero database, how about inviting all the Anata members, for example, um, or for Prospero to, quote, web crawl this, orga this organization? Who would like to answer that? Okay, I'll pass it over to Jeremy. Um, I, I, am I on? Yeah. Okay, I, I think that's a, a, a good suggestion. What we need to do is almost map out all these different sort of stakeholder groups and find a way of sort of uh, informing them about Prospero and then really trying to encourage them to, uh, uh, to make sure that they both use Prospero in their own work and they promote it more widely. So um, HCAI and NARF are clearly one of the key groups. Guidelines International Network would be another group. Uh, the Aerospace Practice Center in the US would be another group. So we, we need to sort of almost do that map out and then think about how we communicate with them um, and think about both probably accessing individual members of those groups as well as potentially um, a, a group globally. I, David Moore here. I'd just like to add that um, we are starting to work with Jin already, and they are we're just sort of working out the details. And I think that might be very useful to consider about um, sort of going across uh, like agencies. And Allison, I will allow you an opportunity to respond to that question as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to say that we are also in discussion with um, uh, Inata, and um, I will be, um, I believe I'm going to their uh, annual meeting uh, in June, July. And uh, we're also presenting at the HTAI conference um, in June. Um, we already have the support of NIHR and CIHR who have um, said that they are, uh, they're already working on making it a requirement of all funded systematic reviews. Um, we're also in dialogue with uh, AHRQ and um, um, somebody else. So we're, we're already uh, well on with um, uh, the, the necessary dialogues. And um, uh, is it all right if I just, uh, I've just seen the next question about updates and um, uh, the, yes, uh, updates can be re-registered and we actually have a definition for what's, what constitutes an update. Um, and if it, um, a different group wants to update a review that's already registered. Um, I think that's a dialogue between the people who are in, involved in um, uh, and undertaking the review. Thank you. I would just, uh, David Moore again, I would just like to add that uh, 
CIHR, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, are uh, very supportive of Prospera. And um, Ian Graham, who's the uh, Vice President for Knowledge Translation, has been asked by the President of CIHR to, to develop a policy whereby um, knowledge syntheses that are funded by CHR um, should be registered within Prospera. So I think that's a, a sort of a very positive move by a very major agency in Canada. Thank you. And it looks as though we may have a couple of other questions come through. So I'll just allow a moment for the chat room for them to appear. And as well, at the end of this session, uh, we are happy to provide slides if you wish, um, and we can send them out to the group. And a reminder for those who may or may not be aware, these sessions are recorded and they're available on our website, as you can see on the screen. It's triplec.cochrane.org. Okay, we have a question come through, <coughs> and it's directed for Jeremy. It says, uh, we at WorkSafe BC, uh, EBPG, have been trying to get other workers' uh, compensation in Canada to start with, to identify and conduct systematic reviews to topics that are relevant to workers' compensation. It's been quite difficult. I think it would be great if Prospero could also become a marketplace where, quote, buyer and seller can meet and discuss. Jeremy. Um, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to respond to this. It may be that either Alison or David would also like to uh, uh, to to, um, uh, uh, to respond to it. But I think one of the things that was highlighted, I think certainly in David and Jesse's uh, and Tammy's presentation, is that the avail uh, the uh, availability of Prospero, Prospero will start to build a much more cohesive uh, um, network of knowledge synthesis uh, uh, review authors around the world. So I think it will start to um, uh, uh, implicitly uh, um, provide that sort of knowledge about which, re which reviewers around the world are engaged in reviews relevant to your, uh, the topics that you're interested in that may well lead to the kind of collaborations that you're talking to. Um, so I think informally it will happen at the moment, just the existence of Prospero is for that. Um, but I don't know whether either Alison or David would like to say anything about whether that is a functionality that you'd like to see uh, further developed. Alison, would you like uh, the opportunity to comment on this? I'll just uh, release my audio. Thank you. Uh, uh, we would definitely be in favor of, of any uh, use of the records on Prospero to promote um, good use of resources and I think that's exactly the sort of thing that we would uh, we would uh, want to if we can facilitate um, then we would definitely want to I don't know if David wants to say anything okay and we have one other question that comes through uh, and it is what happens if a quote lo low quality protocol is registered or is Prospero um, uh, meant to have editorial functions. What happens if the review that was registered ends up to be one of low methodological quality? David? Well, Prospero is uh, really not in the sort of business of uh, managing high or low quality reviews. We're in the business of trying to encourage transparency and collaboration of, of protocols. It's um, sort of difficult to know uh, exactly what you mean by low quality. But uh, I think to get registered, there is um, a, a series of um, uh, questions that need to be addressed. Um, and I, I believe Alison mentioned those. Um, we obviously, uh, Prospero it, it does not control um, what happens after the protocol. And it's sort of difficult to difficult to handle that and I don't think we would be in the sort of business of being editors to the world's protocols. Well thank you. We are at the end of the hour. I again want to thank all of the speakers.
um, for your contributions in um, um, discussing Prospero and uh, registering systematic reviews. Again, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, looking forward to your feedback. Please feel free to uh, contact me, Adrienne Stevens at the Canadian Cochrane Centre, or uh, filling out your evaluation form. I'd be grateful. Have a great day.